How's everybody doing? All right. Thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to be here yet again at South by Austin. What a beautiful town. What beautiful people, even the visitors. And this session is going to cover so many different topics that are extremely important to me. And I'm so, so thrilled to have Dr. Roland Griffiths joining me. Roland, thank you. Good to see you. Great to be here. We're just going to jump right into it. Uh, and uh, for those who don't know me, I write books that sound like infomercial products. I have had a dubious career, not dubious really, partial career, startup investing, so on. Tim Ferriss is my name. But the, the real star today is Dr. Roland Griffiths, who is a clinical psychopharmacologist at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he's also a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neuroscience. Dr. Griffiths has been researching mood-altering compounds for more than 40 years, has published more than 370 scientific papers, and started the psilocybin research program at Johns Hopkins nearly 20 years ago. And we'll get to what psilocybin is, what it does, what that means. <laughs> Thank you for the applause. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Griffiths and his colleagues have been leaders in the reinitiation of research with classic psychedelics psychedelic drugs, which was blocked for a period of several decades. And uh, we will be discussing all manner of aspects of this, including the science, future, the unknowns, and more. Roland, thank you again for making the trek. My pleasure, Tim. Thank you. So we're certainly going to talk about psychedelics and uh, define that and so on. but. You have such an extensive history working with so many different compounds, nearly every drug of abuse, and uh, you're regarded as one of the foremost researchers on the effects of caffeine in humans. So I was wondering if you might start off just by telling us anything about caffeine that perhaps we don't know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, caffeine was uh, one of many compounds that we studied, but it, it was a particularly interesting one because it's the most widely mood, used mood-altering drug in the world. Uh, and uh, about 80%, 80 to 90% of the world's population consumes caffeine. It was of interest to us because it's, it is so culturally embedded within our culture and throughout the world uh, that it only, almost becomes invisible with respect to the fact that it's um, enormously effective at generating uh, uh, daily self-administration, daily patterns of self-administration. And so that became of interest to us, and so we did a number of studies. At the time we started this work, um, the soft drink industry made the claim that caffeine was added as a flavor enhancer, uh, <laughs> which was reminiscent of what the tobacco uh, industry had claimed about uh, nicotine. And so we ran a whole series of studies. So facts that you may or may not know is that um, caffeine's uh, inc incredibly um, uh, effective even at very low doses. So a, a cup of coffee, uh, six ounce cups, a cup of coffee delivers about 100 milligrams of caffeine. If you do careful studies, uh, you can show that people can detect doses of caffeine at 10 milligrams or below. We've actually had shown some people can detect it as a dose lower than 2 milligrams. Um, so it's, if you're not uh, dependent on caffeine, uh, it produces those effects. The withdrawal syndrome has been now well characterized and we, we've done a lot of work with that. And there's a dependent syndrome. But by and large, it's a relatively safe compound, so I'm not here to alarm anyone about their uh, caffeine use. <laughs> and then you're working with caffeine. You've worked with all these various compounds. And as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the research of what we might call classical psychedelics is uh, effectively shut down um, for a period of, of decades. How did you end up? Hey guys, we can hear you in the back, so please keep the noise down. Thanks. Uh, how did you end up coming to contact and researching psychedelics? Yeah. So about 25 years ago, I uh, started a meditation practice. So I've been at Hopkins for uh, going on 45 years doing research on mood-altering drugs. Uh, and, and 
the major focus of my research was drugs of abuse, mood altering compounds. So 25 years ago, I started a meditation practice and, and that got me really interested in and curious about the nature of altered states of consciousness, spiritual experiences and the like. Um, and, uh, and so much so that I actually uh, contemplated at one point uh, leaving Hopkins and taking off for India and spending some time <laughs> in the ashram. Um, but then I became reacquainted with this older literature from the 50s and 60s on the classic psychedelics and the claim that uh, these compounds can in fact uh, um, produce experiences that look very much like naturally occurring uh, spiritual experiences. So um, I turned our attention to study of psilocybin initially. I would have to say that I went in rather as a skeptic uh, because I, uh, there, there were interested parties within the psychedelic world uh, and um, as a, someone who's trained as a skeptical scientist, I was a little suspicious about the level of enthusiasm they were generating for this. So I, so I went in skeptically, we got approval. Well, you know, so the research had been shut down for some periods of decades. And when we put in to uh, the Food and Drug Administration an uh, application to administer psilocybin to people who had never before had a classic psychedelic, uh, it, was the, it, it was the first time such a protocol had been approved in, in several decades. So there, it was by no means certain that we could even get approval at the time. This is the year about 2000. Um, and, um, and so we, we ran a study, it was done in a way that I could pull out a lot of just basic comparative pharmacology information because I wasn't frankly prepared for, for, <laughs> for what happened. And that is that uh, it was done under careful set and setting conditions. Uh, we compared it with high dose of methylphenidate. We did it under deeply... That's Ritalin. Ritalin. Mm -hmm. We did it under deeply blinded conditions where the volunteers and the people guiding the sessions or sitting uh, weren't sure exactly what was being administered when. They knew they would get psilocybin at some point. They thought they'd get a variety of other compounds. And uh, what happened was, and, and these are conditions, the, the basic conditions that we administer psilocybin at Hopkins and we have done it um, ever since. They're kind of based on work that had been developed um, uh, in the 1950s and 60s in which we uh, develop rapport and trust with our, our volunteers. They come in for a, a session. Uh, they're, uh, they've um, developed this established relationship with the two people who are gonna be present throughout the session. And they uh, take a capsule that contains synthesized psilocybin and then put on eye shades and headphones through which they listen to a program of, uh, of music. They're asked to direct their attention inward on their inner experience. And, uh, and the sitters that are there just to help provide a, a safe container for them. And if anxiety or fear arise, which sometimes it does, it does they're there just to provide reassurance. So what happened? Um, so not surprisingly, under those conditions, and we gave a very high dose of psilocybin, 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram, which is the, uh, the mushroom equivalent of about five grams of dried mushrooms. So something that Terence McKenna would call a heroic dose. Um, and under those conditions, not surprisingly, uh, psilocybin produces the visual phenomena and changes in mood and, uh, and uh, cognitive effects. But one of the most interesting features, and, and particularly for me coming at this from the standpoint of meditation and spiritual experience, is that, that there are characteristic features that can emerge under these conditions that look as though these experiences are, are very similar to naturally occurring mystical type experiences that have been reported by uh, 
people in, the, in, uh, in religious circles spontaneously over, um, over generations since recorded history. And, and there, there are ways of measuring those kinds of experiences. We've developed measures of those experiences. So that's, that was the basic phenomena that people had these experiences, and I can talk about the quality of those experiences in, in just a, uh, a, a bit. Um, but people had these experiences, but the, here's the compelling piece of that, is that you know, the experience is over after uh, you know, a period of um, six or eight hours. But when people came back, and we interviewed them, they were coming back two months later, and I'd sit down and ask them, so tell me about this experience. And that's when they would, actually the first few times it happened, we didn't even have a questionnaire that could capture it. it you know, people would say, you know, that was among the most personally meaningful experience of my entire lifetime. And, and I actually couldn't have conceived that something like that uh, would happen, but in, indeed it does, and it happens really reliably. So, in most a, meaningful meaning, right on par with, say, a child being born or getting married. One of those. Yeah, things. first firstborn child, death of a the parent. Uh, these are uh, are remarkable experiences that rate right up among the most salient and most meaningful and most spiritually significant that people have ever, ever had. And astonishingly, in that first study that we did, about 30% said it was the single most spiritually meaningful experience of their entire life. So these experiences and the attributions to these experiences endure. And, that's, and so that's the, that's the core finding and we've, uh, and we've done a whole series of studies in healthy volunteers, either drug inexperienced or experienced volunteers, to um, replicate, look at dose dependence relationship, look at expectancy effects. So we're very confident in that finding. People um, have these experiences. Let me, let me go ahead and describe the features of that classic mystical experience. Um, so, as unlikely as it sounds, because mystical experience sounds like it's, uh, it's uh, pretty vague and woo-woo, but um, those experiences have been actually well described uh, over the course of several hundred years, most notably starting with William James, early 1900s, and then later philosophers and other people in psychology of religion uh, went into the literature and, and figured out the primary features of those experiences. After that, there's a group of people in the psychology of religion uh, that developed measures of those kinds of experiences, and then we have adapted those measures and refined them further. So the, the features of this experience that, that kind of knit them together and that, we, and that we call mystical experience, but it could also be called a peak experience or, trend, or a transcendent experience. But the core features of that are a sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things. There's a sense of one, a oneness. And that's accompanied by a set, uh, the feeling that, that that sense is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness. There's a sense that the, um, that experience is sacred and it's accompanied by, very often, feelings of positive mood like love, tenderness, peacefulness. Transcendence of time and space can also occur. And, and one of the first things that people say after having this experience is the experience is ineffable. They have difficulty putting it into words. So that's the core experience uh, it occurs reliably, it appears to be biologically normal, it's not a function of simple uh, expectancy, um, and people attribute to that experience enduring positive changes in their attitudes, moods, and behavior. And there are a number of studies that we've done to kind of uh, flesh that out. And that kind of experience seems to be fundamental to potential therapeutic effects of these compounds. And we can talk about those therapeutic studies.
So is, is that why those characteristics lend you to describe therapeutic psilocybin as inverse PTSD? Is yeah. there more to it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe this kind of uh, effect. And um, so it's this acute effect that's highly salient, um, but it has, by and large, enduring positive changes in attitudes, moods, and behavior. And so, so we were fishing around what, you know, what do we know that looks like that? And we don't, and there aren't, there aren't uh, experiences in, in the, that are positively avalanced like that that we readily know of. What we do know of is PTSD, and that can occur uh, in response to an acute traumatic event. And there's a neurophysiology and a societal understanding that those kinds of things can, uh, can occur. And so that, that's where we kind of uh, coined this phrase, reverse PTSD-like effect. It's just the inverse of that, but in a positive direction. So to, to try to touch on a few points that might be helpful for people hoping to get a 101 scientific understanding. So we've used the word psychedelic. We've mentioned psilocybin, which is one example, let's just say, of a classic psychedelic. And maybe you could walk us through uh, the sort of principal groupings from, from my understanding, and I'm going to mispronounce this because I read these words a lot, but I don't say them very often. But there you have the, the tryptamines, and then you have the phenethylamines. Close. Close on that. Uh, and what, what would be examples within each of those categories, and are there other categories that we should, we should think about? Yeah, so the classic psychedelics uh, are, are compounds... Um, that have a variety of chemical structures, and as you mentioned, some are tryptamines, some are phenylethylamines. Uh, the, the ones that are, that are best known include three compounds that occur naturally, psilocybin in the mushroom, uh, uh, mescaline in the uh, peyote cactus, and uh, uh, DMT that's uh, uh, used widely in South America. Um, in ayahuasca. Um, in those forms, uh, the use of those compounds date back hundreds, very possibly thousands of years within various cultures in which they were used for religious or divinatory or healing uh, purposes. The other classic uh, psychedelic that's uh, human synthesized is LSD. Um, and then there are... Then there, the, <laughs> Then there are a variety of other uh, d uh, derivative compounds um, from each of those uh, categories. Uh, so we have just focused in on psilocybin as a prototype. These other compounds um, have somewhat different pharmacology and they re hit different receptors. They have different duration of actions and different onsets. But by and large, they're much more similar than uh, than different. So the psychedelics are this unique class of compounds that bind this 5-HT2A receptor and then That's produce... Like serotonin 2A? It's ser yes, serotonin 2A receptor, which is um, the most prevalent uh, subtype of serotonin uh, receptor in brain. And serotonin actually is a very ancient uh, neurotransmitter signaling molecule that go goes back through evolutionary history to the beginning, at least of mammalian species. Uh, so this is a subtype of that. Um, and, uh, and it produces this unique uh, ch change of profile of effects. And it, it defies easy description, um, uh, but it, uh, it produces alteration in consciousness, uh, visualizations, uh, hearing changes, perceptual changes. Um, it, it probes the nature of or elicits changes in consciousness that are seen sometimes in psychotic states or in dream, dreamlike states or in mystical types of experiences. So that's kind of how they're kind of crudely, um, uh, crudely defined. I think they, they shine a very unique light onto the nature of consciousness. And uh, the, ter 
term, there have been so many terms that have been used to describe these compounds, but the term that's uh, most commonly used now is uh, psychedelic, which means mind manifesting. And I think that's, a, that's actually a very good descriptor, but these are also called uh, hallucinogens because they produce visual hallucinations. They've been called psychotomimetics because they produce psychosis-like effects and there are a variety of other uh, descriptors for these compounds. So in, in preparing for this chat, uh, I also had the opportunity to read an advanced copy of Michael Pollan's next book, How to Change Your Mind, good title, uh, which, which covers psychedelics in depth. And uh, one of the areas of research that caught my attention that I had been exposed to before, mostly through the UK, was looking at something uh, referred to as the default mode network. And uh, this, this network that appears, and please correct me, I'm probably going to butcher this, but when highly active to correlate to a sense of self and ego, how you imagine things affecting you, and also pro projection into the future, and uh, let's say perseverating on things that have happened in the past, right? And the, it seems to me, and it seems, of course, to other people who have made this observation before me, that if we look at, say, depression, which some people could think of being as, uh, of, as being trapped in the past, anxiety in a way being trapped in the future, obsessive compulsive disorder, addiction, they seem like very separate pathologies, but in fact, uh, if you look at how psychedelics plausibly have some impact on the default mode network by making it less active, that you're kind of hitting all these birds with one stone. It's not a panacea, but how do you think about this, this research? Is, is there anything particularly exciting about that or nuanced about that that, uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah, well, yeah, let me talk a little bit just about the neuroscience of, of these and, then, and within that context, I'll talk about the default mode network. So we know these compounds, these psychedelic compounds, bind the uh, serotonin 2A receptor, and that's their molecular site of activity. And, and from that, they kick off a cascade of uh, uh, downstream effects. They're affecting other neurotransmitter systems. And so we know from neuroimaging studies um, where serotonin 2A receptors are in the brain. We know from neuroimaging studies what areas of brain are activated and what areas of brain are deactivated when you give something like psilocybin. We know something about uh, the network functions that are either upregulated or downregulated when you give psilocybin. And one of the interesting ones, and it, and it tells a very compelling story, is this default mode network. So this default mode network as, as you mentioned, has been associated with self-referential processing and, and um, also uh, obsessional thinking. It's upregulated in depression. And the interesting finding was that psilocybin decreases function in the default mode network. And the other prominent thing that decreases functioning in the default mode network is meditation and long-term meditators. And that kind of makes sense. It, it, it has some, that, that's why this, this um, network in particular is attractive because it, it feels like it has explanatory power. That this sense of self, the dampening sense of self, is, um, uh, is, a, is an emergent property of, uh, of administration of psilocybin. And that may account for this a sense of uh, uh, unity that that could emerge from that. But it, let, me, let me just push on a little bit further in the, in the neuroscience because it's really interesting. It's, it's being unpacked, although we're far from understanding it. So um, a variety of other network functions are, are changed. There's one classic uh, uh, figure that came out of the, uh, it's a, uh, uh, picture, a diagram, that came out of work done at Imperial College that shows the interconnectedness uh, of different brain regions uh, after giving placebo and then after giving psilocybin. And the same thing occurs with LSD. And the remarkable feature of that is that there's 
under psilocybin, there's all of this inter interconnectivity occurring, and it's not it's not random. I mean, there are um, emergent uh, connections being made in brain where where all kinds of information is being passed back and forth, and then um, after the drug is eliminated, those effects subside. So one wonders, well, what's, what's going on there and how might that account for some of these experiences? And, uh, and so one hypothesis about that is that, um, that in, uh, uh, in under psychiatric conditions where there are network functions that are are being mismanaged or not working very well, uh, there's this opportunity for um, global interconnectivity and that resolves perhaps resetting some of these networks to more healthy patterns. And so the metaphor appropriate for this, this form uh, is like resetting a computer. Uh, and, and, it, and, and so I've come to think of these um, experiences uh, or, or these effects as being potentially neuroplastic states that may allow for rewiring of the brain. And that interestingly accounts for the diversity of the potential therapeutic applications and other applications because um, it's, it's just well established that the experiences uh, that people have with these compounds are very much determined by set and setting. What, what intentionality is being brought in, what people are thinking, how the setting is interacting with that. And so that kind of accounts for why um, under our conditions with cigarette smokers who want to quit, they can have an experience like this and feel free of cigarette smoking. Whereas in the 50s and 60s, millions of people took psychedelics. Smoking was permiss very permissive in the culture and they didn't, they didn't quit smoking. But with the intention to quit and then, you know, in, in other therapeutic applications. Um, so that's kind of a sketch of, of the neuroscience. But then I, I, I just want to say one other thing. It, you know, it, it sounds like you know, we're and we are, we're moving rapidly along understanding the, some of the neuroscience underpinnings. Um, but in the, in the largest sense, uh, these drugs are perturbing consciousness. And our understanding of the nature of consciousness is incredibly primitive. There's something in, uh, in neuroscience and in cognitive science called the hard problem of consciousness. And it's called that because it's a hard problem. <laughs> there's, no, there's no evident solution to it. And, and it's a question about are, um, is consciousness explicable in terms of reductionistic you know, neural molecular mechanisms? And there are a, a number of people would say, Abs it, it has to be, how could it be otherwise? That has to be a given. Uh, uh, but if, if, you, if you think hard about that, uh, it may or may not be the case, and that's why, that's why we have this hard problem of consciousness. But we're nowhere close to being able to crack that. And so I, I think of these compounds as so interesting because they're shining a light on the very nature of consciousness. And I think they have something to tell us about what that is and what it is to be human, to be aware that we're aware. Uh, and, um, and so it's, it's puzzling and very exciting and an opportunity for further research. You mentioned, you mentioned smoking, and I, I'd love to look at some of the therapeutic applications, because no doubt some people are just saying, like, all right, bending time and space, oneness, OK, sounds interesting, but also might sound like you're just tripping your balls off. OK. <laughs> So what are the serious applications here, right? Not to say that the mystical experience doesn't have extremely powerful uh, clinical implications, but if we wanted to be really direct about it, uh, could you talk to some of the therapeutic uses 
yeah. of psychedelics. Uh, and what I find so fascinating, and, and you mentioned sort of briefly in metaphor is a reset, but is the persistence of effect in some of these cases. It's, it just seems so uncommon to me that you have one to three sessions and then you could, you could give more concrete examples, but six, three, six months later, 12 months later, there's such a, a durability of effect. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that is the puzzling, very interesting piece of that, that these effects are so durable. And, and how that's explained, to what extent uh, there's psychology, to what extent it's just raw neuroscience and receptor network resetting is unclear, and it's going to be interactive uh, between the two. So let me talk a little bit about therapeutic applications. So there, we've done studies in three areas now. One is uh, existential distress in patients with a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. These are people who are seriously uh, depressed or anxious. They've been given a diagnosis. Most of them had either metastatic or recurrent uh, cancer. And some, some people um, will receive a diagnosis like that and be able to integrate it in their uh, in their worldview and their life situation and, uh, and, and certainly not be uplifted by it but not be devastated by it. Others are devastated by it and, and it's understandable. I mean, this is getting at a, the core existential question about what happens to us when we die and what does, what does that mean. And, um, and there, was, there was research done in the 50s and 60s and we picked up on that uh, to look at the effects of psilocybin and, and these kinds of sessions on people who had this incredible distress. Um, and what that research, we published that a couple of years ago. Uh, NYU also published a companion uh, study to that. Uh, um, UCLA had published a small trial a, a few years uh, earlier all of them point in the same direction, and that is that these kinds of experiences, these opening experiences, some, sometimes having these mystical uh, qualities to it, or at least personal and spiritual significant qualities, you know, are, are very therapeutic for this group. Uh, and so, um, in this case, we, d we did a study in which we compared either a, low, a very low dose of psilocybin to uh, a very uh, significant high dose. So the active placebo was a low dose? It was dose. an active placebo, and we, and we did that to... Which is one of the, I mean, not, not to interrupt, but like one of the big challenges with psychedelics is how do you placebo control? It's right? Particularly if you have people who read a lot about it beforehand, and so they're looking for what to expect. Very, very challenging. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a huge problem. Um, so these are, these are people then who got uh, psilocybin and, uh, and we were able to compare them to the lower, lower dose group. Uh, but but they, uh, they knew that they would get doses of psilocybin, they didn't know what those doses would be and there were a number of other controls. Anyway, we're, we're confident that the effects are due to psilocybin. So the extraordinary uh, uh, outcome of this study was that in most volunteers they experienced a rather abrupt decrease in symptoms that was sustained and we went out to six months and uh, it's about uh, w there's one measure of clinical response it's called just the uh, percentage of people showing a clinical response and that's using uh, classic gold standard uh, clinician rating measures of depression and to show a clinical response you have to have a 50 percent decrease and about at six months about um, 80 percent of this population were showing a clinical response about um, this is in depression about 60 percent were in complete remission that is their scores on this uh, on on these measures were no different than the normal population now that's remarkable because that's the effect of a single administration of psilocybin under these conditions. It, we don't 
we don't have anything equivalent within psychiatry uh, that, uh, that's similar to that insofar as it's a, a, a single session, a six hour session, uh, put in the context of, of uh, support, but to have that kind of enduring effect. And it's the basis of, of uh, that finding uh, and some other findings that uh, the USONA Research Institute and, and other, other groups are moving forward in dialogue with FDA to develop uh, registration trials to allow medical uh, approval of these drugs. So that's one example of a, a clinical effect. Um, the Imperial Group over in, uh, in London uh, showed that psilocybin was effective, and this was a pilot study, so they, they didn't have a control group, but it's shown that psilocybin was effective at treating people with treatment-resistant depression. And we have, partly sponsored by yours truly, and probably some of you in this audience. Just as, just as context, we first met at the home of someone named George Sarlo, whose entire family was affected by the Holocaust. He had a number of long-standing psychological issues, the, re the resolution of which he attributes uh, in large measure to uh, supervised psychedelic use. Uh, he was doing a fundraiser for a lot of the research related to psilocybin, uh, also MDMA through USONA, MAPS, Hefter. These are a few organizations you could look up. And, uh, and we met, and having a family history of bipolar depression, and certainly some of you may know, I've had a lot of uh, difficulty in manage, managing that myself, uh, crowdfunded and also contributed my own funds to uh, look, or to facilitate the research that you're doing looking at treatment-resistant depression. So that's the background. Yeah, I, I'll just add a footnote to that. Um, I had no idea who Tim Ferriss was when I, when I met him. And so here's this guy who comes up to me and says, uh, you know, that, this is really interesting and, um, you know, and maybe I can uh, yeah, put out some information and get some funding. And I can't tell you, there are so many people come to me and say, you know, I'd love to help out and, you know, I, I, you know I'm willing to really do something. And, you know, what they mean is they're going to donate three hours a week to analyze some data or something. And so I was cautious and uh, kind. I'd, I hope I wasn't dismissive. But I said, well, th well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And, you know, here's, here's my card and, uh, and subsequently found <laughs> Tim Ferriss is, has this yeah, huge uh, impact in, in the world and he put together this CrowdRise campaign and within weeks it had hit our mark for funding. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks to everybody who contributed. So I feel like I hijacked the Imperial folks now. So they're, they're working on this. So, right, so the Imperial Group uh, showed in a pilot study that uh, psilocybin uh, seems to have efficacy in treatment resistant depression. Tim uh, raised funds. It, it, the approval process is, um, uh, is long and tedious to go through uh, the regulatory approval required at the institution, at FDA, and the DEA. And, um, and uh, Tim being a do-it-now kind of guy, I think he's a little baffled by <laughs> the duration of time that it took to get the study up and running. But it's, run it's running now, it's interesting, it's gonna be complex. It's not gonna be you know, a simple magic bullet for depression. There are gonna be variations of types of depression. But I I'm very hopeful that that's gonna uh, show something very interesting. And, and be another approvable target. So that's uh, existential anxiety, depression, major depression. Can I just hit, uh, yeah. just interrupt for one second, pause. How many people in this audience know someone who's taking antidepressants of some type and is still depressed? Almost every single hand in the audience. And that's not to say that antidepressants on the market don't have tremendous efficacy for some people, they can be a lifesaver, but there are 
so many people for which these existent modalities do not work or work sufficiently, uh, which is part of the reason why I'm so deeply interested in furthering the science related to this. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you for that. And, and um, uh, there haven't been new antidepressants developed recently. There's been a whole spin-off of compounds of the SSRI uh, type. But this is such an entirely different model. Uh, it's a different underlying uh, uh, pharmacology um, that it's, uh, it's, it's way too interesting uh, not to pursue, although it's, it, it's very likely not right for all forms of depression. So th this is actually a very good segue because I don't want to make it seem like uh, either of us, which we're not at all, are presenting this as a very one-sided panacea. So I wanted to ask you, what are the risks that you've observed, uh, the short or long-term side effects, What's the, what's the flip side, if there is one, to the benefits, potential benefits that we've been talking about? Yeah, so um, sometimes in the kind of zeal and enthusiasm for uh, the upside potential, the, down, the, the risks get ignored, but they're, they are real. Uh, so in, in our, our studies, we screen people very carefully. We screen out uh, people with with various psychiatric histories. We're probably more conservative than we need to be, um, but we'll, we'll rule out anyone even with a family history of psychotic illness. We rule out bipolar. And, and the limits of, of how wise it is and how necessary it is to do the, all the rule outs that we do has yet to be determined. But uh, I think it's incumbent on us, at least temporarily, to err well on the side of, of caution. Um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of risk, we, we ran, um, so with, within our clinical setting, when we have screened people, prepared them, and administered and provided aftercare, uh, almost everyone reports um, having benefited from these experiences. Some people will have very difficult or unpleasant experiences, but almost everyone will say that their well-being and life satisfaction has been increased as a, as, through uh, participation. However, what, what we did is went trolling for the very worst, case, uh, uh, worst cases we ran a large internet survey of almost 2,000 people asking them to provide detailed information about their very worst bad trip, the most difficult time they ever had on psilocybin. So, so this isn't, this isn't a representative population. Many of these people had multiple uh, psilocybin experiences and they're telling us about their very worst case so you have to get that in context but uh, e even with that caveat um, you know it's it's not a it's not an entirely rosy picture so about 11 percent of people put themselves um, at risk uh, for physical harm about three percent ended up in an ER, about 3% said they engaged in violent or dangerous behavior. 8% said uh, their well-being or life satisfaction as a consequence of this experience was decreased. Of those who had had the experience more than a year ago, about 10% said they had enduring psychological problems, and 8% had sought out professional treatment. So there, really does appear that some people can be damaged by these kinds of experiences or at least feel that they're damaged and continue to seek out support. But that contrasts uh, the, the kind of work that we, we have done at Hopkins. So it would it suggests either that these people have unique vulnerabilities and, and very possibly some of them do, but it's probably more the case that they're taking these substances under um, suboptimal conditions. Finding a shaman on Craigslist. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't do that, please. Right, right. 
I'm going to make ayahuasca in my slow cooker. Want to come over? <laughs> Don't do that, please. Uh, so just to touch on unique vulnerabilities, potentially, uh, based on the reading I've done, it seems like uh, people with a family history of schizophrenia, particularly potentially vulnerable to this, are there any, if you had to put together a short list of people who are particularly, uh, who, who seem to be predisposed to having negative effects with these compounds, is, is there, are, are there any that show up more often than others? Well, yeah, let me just talk a little bit about the schizophrenia and what, and what we know of that. I mean, so, so these, these compounds back in the 50s and 60s were used for all kinds of clinical indications and they were given to schizophrenics. Um, uh, there's, there's a sense that these compounds might exacerbate um, a psychotic uh, process and in, in so doing be destabilizing to people. Um, there, there was one interesting study uh, in the archives of these earlier, earlier work where uh, LSD was given to two identical twins, one of whom had schizophrenia, the other one did not. So, so the genetic loading for schizophrenia was there. And the one who didn't have schizophrenia did have some uh, enduring effects that lasted, as best we can tell from the case report, for a day or two and then resolved. So that's someone with potentially a full genetic loading for schizophrenia who as best we can tell from this report, ended up with a difficult experience, but not an a enduringly damaging experience. So what, we don't know the limits, but right now we exclude people uh, who have histories of uh, schizophrenia or psychotic illness, uh, bipolar illness, um, and people uh, with whom we don't believe we can develop good clinical rapport. So people who fall into a borderline uh, personality class uh, um, are people who we would, uh, we, we would not accept in, into treatment. But again, we don't know the limits. So you, you've had a, a, along with other researchers in the field, uh, but you've been at it certainly longer than many, the ability to refine the recipe, so to speak, right? To over time, to replicate the variables or maintain the variables that seem to work and to change those that seem not to contribute to a positive experience. So I'd love to just walk through a number of questions related to this. Keeping in mind, guys, this is DEA licensed, IRB approved university halls, not your garage. Uh, so you, you did mention the screening. What goes on during the prep sessions? And how long do you, do you prep prior to the first session? So, uh, conventionally, we spend about eight hours of clinical time in, in preparation, and that can be um, over the course of perhaps four two-hour meetings or uh, two or three meetings of longer duration. Uh, the volunteers meeting with the two sitters or guides for the session, and we're in effect doing a, a life review with them, what we want them to do is tell us where they are, how they're showing up to our, our session, what issues might be um, active for them. But the core, the core of that is to establish this sense of trust and rapport. And, and at the end of that, what we hope is that people can come into this session and entrust themselves to this process because with a high dose of psilocybin, there just has to be this level of surrender and, and trust. And it's, you know, it's like the game that you played as a kid of falling back into the arms of, of your friends and hopefully they didn't drop you. You, you, you need uh, to be in the presence of people who, who, uh, who you trust. And, um, and, that, and that's basically our, our preparation. And those people those two people are the sole people that are with the volunteer throughout the duration of the, of the session. What types of questions do they ask? Is it just tell, me about, tell you me, me about your life? Is it, yeah, well, we go through. How's whole, your relationship with your wife? I mean, what? we go through a whole life history, starting 
starting uh, growing up and family of origin and uh, psychosocial history and uh, career uh, work history, relationship issues, sexual issues. Um, uh, what what meaning uh, are they looking for and searching for in life? And then, of course, if it's a clinically oriented protocol, there'll be focus on that clinical indication. So if it's anxiety, depression, secondary to cancer, we'll talk a lot about uh, what that means to them, their cancer treatment, how they're holding that. If it's the addictions, we'll talk about addictions and we'll will actually embed as part of our preparation um, some cognitive behavior therapy aimed specifically at that addictive process. So for this cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, for those people who have uh, any curiosity related to Stoic philosophy, those two are very, very closely related. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that and dig deeper. Do you form or help them to form the intention, which you mentioned earlier, in those preparatory sessions? Is it during, or I should say, before the first administration, the first session itself? And how do you help them to formulate that? Do you ask them to get it down to a sentence? Do you ask them to share it? What does that look like? Yeah. Um, so we actually try, try to um, uh, uh, to, uh, to not focus too strongly on an intention. So with something like cigarette smoking dependence, the implicit intention, of course, is to get... They up. signed up to quit, smoke. right? Yeah. But, um, but the intention for the session uh, is much broader than that. It's being curious and learning from the nature of the experience and letting that manifest in any way that it presents itself. So we very much um, try to steer people away from having specific intentions. In fact, we encourage people not to read extensively. If these are hallucinogen or uh, psychedelic naive people, we'll encourage them not to read very much about psychedelic experiences. Because if they do, um, they're gonna import all kinds of expectances based on other people's uh, stories. Oh, well, the, you know, the, this person had a, an encounter with God or they had, uh, they uh, met um, their, their dead relative or they had a visualization of the nature of the world or evolution or whatever. And, and, and I, I see that as um, actually just getting in the way of being able to encounter these experiences authentically as they present themselves in the present moment. And that's, that's the key for this to work out. But, um, but there's kind of an overarching intention, certainly with the smokers, certainly with the cancer patients, that somehow this is going to be of value to you in terms of what you're going to do going forward. We, we make no promises about um, whether or not it's going to work. And in our early, very early studies, we weren't confident that we could even, you know, replicate the basic uh, phenomena. So on the, on the day of administration, uh, what time of day is that? Maybe it's variable. I have no idea. And uh, what are some of the key ingredients for a successful first session leading up to the actual ingestion of the psilocybin? Mm -hmm. What's some of the language mm -hmm. that has proven helpful over time? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Anything at all? Mm -hmm. so, um, so they've had this preparation, and the preparation usually takes place in the session room. So they're familiar with this environment. It's set up like a, a, a living room-like environment. There's a couch and chairs and artwork on the, on the, on the walls. Um, and so, uh, and, and part of the preparation has been not only discussion, but also uh, the practice laying down on the couch, putting on the eye shades and listening to the music and, and letting themselves flow with the music. They've practiced that already. Yes, we've practiced that. And we've also practiced what it would mean for us to support them. Uh, so, so we may say, 
if anxiety or fear arise, we, we want you to give voice to that. Pay, it, pay attention to that. Be interested in that. There's nothing in consciousness that can hurt you. Uh, and the only problem becomes one in which you reify an object of consciousness, be it a, a demon or the thought that you're going crazy or the thought that you're dying. If you believe that to be true, then, then that's really uncomfortable. So we ask them to... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Demons eating my face and I'm going crazy. This is really uncomfortable. <laughs> So, that's, but that's actually part of the preparation, is um, this is an, ex, a, a, an exploration of the nature of consciousness. Consciousness can manifest in myriad number of ways. None of it can hurt you, but it can give the appearance of being something that's threatening or, or, um, or very difficult. And so we'll, we rehearse with them, what, what does that mean? So if you see this demonic figure, what do you do? And the natural tendency is going to be to run or flee or fight. And either one of those actually reifies that in a way that's just not helpful. The key is to identify the object of consciousness as just that. This is a manifestation of consciousness. This is none other than you're looking at yourself. And, and if you can bring that level of understanding into the experience, it's a way of navigating through these experiences. So we've, we've discussed that, and we've discussed that if these um, very fearful things come up, such as dying or feeling like you're going crazy, um, then give voice to that. Hopefully giving voice to it is enough of a reminder to allow someone to step back and go, oh, you know, I'm terrified uh, because there's a demon here and I remember I'm not supposed to run and it doesn't feel very comfortable getting any closer, but that's, I, that's what I know I need to do. It's being curious and interested. So we tell them to give voice to it, but then of course that alerts the sitters or the guides. And what they'll do is just, you know, maybe take, take an arm and just say, you're doing fine. You feel as though you're dying, you're not. You've taken psilocybin. You're gonna be back to normal at the end of, end of the day. But you feel like it, respect that. Go into that experience. What is it to die? Let yourself die within this. We're not going to let you, <laughs> but let yourself into that. You see the demon? Go be in investigated. Um, and so that's the kind of preparation that goes in. So on session day, then people uh, come in. Uh, and they usually come in around 8.30 in the morning. They've had a very light um, breakfast. We ask them very low fat, not a large uh, breakfast take their normal amount of caffeine, if that's what they do, because I'm very sensitive to caf uh, the consequences of people not taking caffeine, and that's caffeine withdrawal. We don't want that confounding this. Um, and uh, and, uh, and we'll uh, sit down with them for s several minutes uh, beforehand, settle them in, we get a baseline blood pressure, because our protocol requires that we take repeated blood pressures and psilocybin will elevate uh, blood pressure sometimes. Um, and then, uh, then at, at that juncture, um, uh, if, if I'm not one of the guides, I'll come into the room and we do a little ceremony that we have a, a very nice Mazatec incense burner uh, uh, that was used for incense by Mazatec Indians and the Mazdek Indians were the ones that originally used psilocybin for ceremonial purposes. And the capsule is placed in there and, and given to the person to, uh, to take. They drink a, six ounces of water with it. Um, I, I leave at that point. The, uh, the monitors or the sitter's guides will usually then sit down with the volunteer and we'll look through 
um, usually art books or books of nature paintings. We're trying to get them out of the thinking mind and discursive mind and just into a sense of presence. And, uh, and it's usually not long that we'll encourage them then to put on their eye shades and just start turning inward. And then the onset of psilocybin can occur in as quickly as 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, very often it's detectable within uh, 30 minutes, but there can be a lot of variation in that. It reaches peak effects at two or three hours after administration and then starts tapering off. So by four o'clock in the afternoon, people are pretty, pretty much back to baseline and we'll start having them answer an extensive battery of questions then at the end of the session day, then I'll come in and we'll, we'll all sit down and talk about the session. The volunteer uh, will have a pickup person that would be usually a friend uh, or a spouse um, who would then come into the room and uh, would be responsible for taking the volunteer home. What, is, what are the most important elements of the, the post-care after they go home? Yeah, so that's a, it's a great question. So we have our volunteers come back the very next day. So uh, post-session, we ask them to jot down uh, and write some kind of description of their experience. And sometimes it's a pretty overwhelming uh, assignment because, as I mentioned, one of the features of these experiences are they're felt to be ineffable, so they just don't lend themselves to putting things into words. Um, uh, but we encourage them to do so and bring that report with them the following day. And so we'll meet with them for an hour or two the following day. We're partly, partly it's safety, but partly it's uh, starting to weave the meaning-making process out of these experiences. Very, very often for lots of volunteers, the meaning of that, those experiences are, is immediately apparent, or at least some of it. Uh, but it's also something that people end up contemplating over time. And, uh, and the nature of what they feel that they've taken from the experience may alter somewhat over time. But, but acutely they know they've had these remarkable reorganizational experiences. So I, I, want to, I want to ask you so many questions, but first I want to provide a little bit of context for people who might not be familiar with why these drugs were effectively made not unresearchable, but very hard to research at the very least for a period of decades. And there are many different perspectives on this, but my, my basic understanding is for primarily political reasons and sort of, uh, different types of factors that uh, it could certainly be considered uh, non-scientific. But could you give us just a quick primer on, on your perspective on what happened as it relates to why such seemingly promising compounds for so many applications effectively went offline. Yeah, they, they did indeed go offline. So this is kind of rewinding to the 1950s and 60s, and, and these compounds, um, psilocybin and LSD, uh, uh, became, uh, came to the attention of clinicians uh, for therapeutic purposes, and when they were first um, uh, when they were first synthesized and made available for study, uh, Sandoz uh, that um, synthesized uh, LSD uh, thought of them as psychotomimetics, and they they thought that this would be a valuable way for psychiatrists to come to learn and understand what psychotic process is like. It was Delicid. What? Was it, the drug, was that called Delicid? Was that the Sandoz? I think it might have been. Yeah, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's mm -hmm. LSD. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so, uh, and so there, there were 
possibly thousands of studies or, or observations made during that period of time. Um, and, and then uh, in the 1960s, Timothy Leary and uh, Richard Alpert at Harvard uh, got involved uh, with this work. They actually did some very interesting initial work and then that research program jumped off the rails a, a bit with uh, <laughs> Timothy Leary's advocacy of uh, turn on, tune in, drop out. They ended up being fired from Harvard. That coalesced with um, the anti-war movement of the 1960s and a, and a strong sense of anti-establishment um, fever. Uh, and uh, and uh, we had the be-ins and the love-ins and, uh, and that was pretty terrifying, I think, to our organizational political structure at the time. And so Richard Nixon concluded at one point that Timothy Leary was the most dangerous man in, in America uh, because of this advocacy. And so we, um, we, the whole field got pushed back. There was a sense, uh, and it turns out to have been incorrect, but there was a sense that use of these drugs was uh, more dangerous, that the risk involved uh, didn't outweigh the potential benefits. And that was a calculus that emerged from um, overzealous media coverage of adverse events. Uh, but in effect, and it's a, it's a very interesting case in the history of science, in effect, it functionally shut down all of research with these compounds. So. Uh, funding dried up for it, federal approval of, of these kinds of studies dried up for it. It became um, uh, con considered uh, um, not good form within academic centers to study these drugs. And so it was, it's really quite a, a fascinating, you know, um, chapter in the history of science in which this unique set of compounds were kind of rebranded for, for poor reasons, thought to be toxic, and removed completely from clinical research for a period of decades. And I, you know, when I, when I think about that, I, you know, I think what, you know, what comparable thing could we possibly imagine? I mean, just think what 20 years of science does. And, and these compounds, Clinically, we're put in the deep freeze for 20 years. Sometimes I felt, when in initiating this research program again, kind of like Rip Van Winkle. I mean, it's like, you know, we have all these technologies in terms of clinical pharmacology and imaging methods and understanding how to do psychometric uh, measures and have never been applied to these compounds. Um, so I think it was a case of very bad PR that shut it down. <laughs> uh, just a quick housekeeping note. If anybody who's working on the South by team could close those doors, it's very distracting just to hear everybody talking in the hallway. We still have 20 minutes left. That'd be really helpful. Uh, but it, we could talk about the, I mean, you have, for instance, the Controlled Substances Act, Schedule 1. So these psychedelics are currently within Schedule 1. What other types of drugs are within Schedule 1, and what are the criteria for being Schedule 1? Well, there's a catch-22 in Schedule 1, and that is that it, it, it has to be um, a drug, a substance of abuse, and it has to have no medical indication. So, um, so in the United States, heroin is in, in Schedule 1, and there are a number of analogs of opiates that are in uh, schedule one. Cocaine has a medical use, so it's in schedule two. Um, so schedule one is the most restrictive and it really dampens the opportunity to do research because it, it raises the regulatory and institutional costs in terms of just undertaking these studies. And that's where we got mired for over a year in just approval processes. Uh, to 
go forward with the uh, depression trial in spite of the fact now that we've been doing work with psilocybin for 18 years. We have a lot of safety data. We've given psilocybin to over 300 people. We've uh, conducted over 600 psilocybin sessions, yet it comes under the scrutiny of Schedule 1 and all the incumbent bureaucracy. Okay, so we have this incredibly difficult research, incredibly costly research, and I'm going to make this up, but for, you know, something that someone might be able to get on the street for $50 costs many, many thousands of dollars to administer when you want to go through the proper channels, which of course you want to do. Very, very difficult, and there are organizations now and that have been going for some time, MAPS since 86, looking at MDMA specifically, uh, then you have USONA, Hefter, looking at psilocybin, uh, that are uh, hoping to put both through phase three trials and to uh, ultimately re have these compounds rescheduled uh, for broader use with medical supervision. But you have chosen a really difficult path in some respects. Why do it? I mean, what has kept you going for so long? It's really difficult. And I mean, I, I, we can talk about Bob Jesse another time, but I mean, fantastic, incredible figure who's been very influential behind the scenes. Uh, but I believe he's called you a scientist beyond reproach, right? And for this particular field, that's very important that there are people like yourself, people at, say, NYU or uh, UCSF or other places who are uh, not those who have come into it drinking the Kool Aid, so to speak. I mean, you're coming in with very, uh, top-notch credentials and skepticism, and yet, as you pointed out, this is an extremely laborious, difficult path. What has kept you going for so long? It, I mean, it's the most interesting game in town. I, I cannot think of something more important and interesting that I could spend my time on. As I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I think this is a window into the nature of consciousness. For, for me, who has had a meditation practice now for 25 years, and I deeply respect the, um, uh, the methodology of meditation and what's to be learned about this, uh, the psychedelics, um, are a convergent methodology for really understanding and investigating the nature of mind. And what, <laughs> and what, what's more interesting than that, Tim? I mean, what, I, <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> and if, if you make the argument that our entire experience of life, you know, the sensation that we have ahead, the sensation that we are something behind our eyes, all the pain, all the joy, I mean, it is a function, arguably, of mind, right, without getting too out there. I mean, we're already pretty out there, but trying to look, look at it in a somewhat non-controversial way, uh, it's, it's really potentially all-encompassing, right, at least the, the study of that, and it's not necessarily always through the lens of psychedelics, through meditation and other practices as well. Uh, we don't have all too much time left, but I know that there are at least one or two studies that you're currently recruiting for. Uh, would you like to mention those for people who may qualify? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, uh, so the, depression, the depression trial is one that's ongoing. It's been a difficult, and it's a difficult trial to recruit for because we, we uh, can only uh, admit people who are within commuting distance of Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore, but they could be from, if, yeah, if they have the wherewithal to travel down, they, they could do that, but there are 13 sessions. That's open to anyone uh, 21 to 75 years old with a current episode of uh, clinical uh, depression, and the hooker there is they cannot currently be on uh, any SSRI, any antidepressant, or any other mood-altering medication. Now, when we move into phase three trials with USONA, we're going to offer the opportunity to taper people off of antidepressants. But yeah, we'd be very eager to get referrals for that. And then, um, in collaboration with NYU, we're studying, as I mentioned earlier, this, this study in ordained clergy. And so these are uh, clergy from various religious traditions. They have to be ordained. They can never have had a psychedelic uh, previously. 
It's a really interesting study. And, and we're looking in particular, and, and we can fly people in, so there's no, there's no constraint. We've actually brought someone in from Mexico to participate. So that, that, there's not a constraint there. We're in particular looking for a Hindu priest and a mom, uh, a Christian or a Catholic priest, um, a Buddhist uh, Roshi, or, or other people of Christian traditions. We, we actually have uh, hit our quota uh, with Jewish rabbis. <laughs> uh, but those, those are the two, two studies that we're actively recruiting would love to. Jewish rabbis love mystic states. <laughs> I think that's, the, I'm, <laughs> that's what I conclude from that. Judge me if you will. Uh, now, for people who do qualify for these studies, uh, Roland mentioned, Dr. Gifts mentioned a few of the parameters. I will be publishing this on my podcast and ultimately at tim.blog forward slash podcast. I will include links to all the, the requisite resources and so on so that you can, uh, you can actually get to where you need to be as it relates to the, the recruitment uh, and so on. Uh, so we have, we have just a little bit of time left. Uh, I want to talk, maybe we can, we can wrap up in one way, and then I'll have a few closing comments on uh, your medallions. So you have some medallions. Some might call them challenge coins. If you're from the military, you may recognize them as such. And uh, you give them to staff and volunteers uh, at points at Johns Hopkins. Can you describe these medallions, please? <laughs> well, yeah, I produced a, a, a little medallion. I actually always carry one right in my pocket, so, so I, I have it. Um, and, and, uh, and, and this has been a great pleasure to me to, to be able to gift to people. And I gift it mostly to volunteers who have had uh, these deeply meaningful experiences. And, um, and I, I start by asking them uh, a question. I said, I have a question for you. Uh, I say, are you aware right now that you're aware? And the response can be very interesting. So some people will, will say, well, y yes, of course. And <laughs> other, other people will look like deers in the headlight. Am I aware that I'm aware? Um, no, I'd, I'm not sure I am. Uh, and so then we have to have a little conversation about that. But it's the point I make is, look, <laughs> this is part of the human condition. Unless you're a zombie, and I'm guessing you're not, uh, I'm guessing you have an inkling <laughs> that, that if you al allow yourself, you'll recognize that that's actually the only thing that you're aware of. It's, you know, and, uh, and so, so once I get an affirmative a answer to that, yes, I'm, they'll say, yes, I'm aware that I'm aware. Then I'll hand them the medallion. And on the front of the medallion, it has uh, the psilocybe mushrooms, which are the native mushrooms from which psilocybin comes from. And these the psilocybe is the psilocybe mushrooms that I've mispronounced for 25 years. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and these people have all had a psilocybin experience. And then uh, at the bottom of that, it says, uh, may you remain aware of awareness. And that's my wish, hope, prayer for myself and for them and for all of us. And it seems to me that it's the kernel of what the spiritual path, the path of meditation, the path of human awakening is about. And that's this cultivation of this astonishing fact that we're aware that we're aware. And so often we drop into forgetfulness about that. We, we, be, we lo lose track, we get so lost in the story uh, that we lose track of that. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the prayer. At, on the other side of the medallion at the very top, it says meditation. And these, many of these people haven't done meditation, but I encourage people to do that because that's the tried and true course for investigating the nature of mind and doing so in a, in a stable way. And then at the bottom of the, uh, that other side of the coin, uh, there's a quote and it says, the, the true method 
of knowledge is experiment. And that's from the mystic poet William Blake. Uh, and I take that to mean that that's what we do when we meditate, that's what we do when we ask ourselves, am I aware that I'm aware? That's what happens when you take psilocybin and you bring in that uh, focus of awareness. Um, so that's the, that's the story of the medallion. All right, so I love the medallion and uh, I'm very honored to have one, so thank you for that. And I want to make just a few, a few closing remarks. So uh, Dr. Griffiths just mentioned experiment. And I've spent the last five or six years, more really, but five or six years looking for how to shift my energies and attention that I paid to startups, technology startups, to science and scientific studies. And I've been involved with a number of, of different fields, including the Ghazali Lab at UCSF, uh, looking at how to use software and video games potentially to reverse age-related cognitive decline, uh, but uh, have really, over time, become more and more convinced that uh, while I will spend a portion of the time on the cutting edge, looking at the scientific investigation of these compounds that have existed for, certainly existed for thousands of years, but potentially have been used by different cultures in ceremonial contexts for millennia, uh, is the most important focal point that, that I could put my energies into. So that began formally with the treatment resistant depression at Johns Hopkins. And uh, it's very unusual that you find a place where so little does so much. And usually you find something that is sort of high impact, high probability of success, and highly funded, but this, in this case, it's not very highly funded. And it, it, I was introduced to a story by a friend of mine who's a surgeon not too long ago, uh, Catherine McCormick. So everybody should look up Catherine McCormick. So in uh, 1953, she had attended MIT early, and she met a scientist named Gregory uh, Pincus. Gregory Pincus had been working on hormonal birth control, which you can imagine at that period of time, not a terribly popular subject. And she began with a $100,000 annual uh, level of support over time, two million, and not very long thereafter, we're talking, I think it was 57, that the birth control pill was approved, but not for birth control, it was for menstrual disorders. And then only after that fact was approved. So how many people have been impacted by that? Catherine McCormick single-handedly, <laughs> effectively single-handedly, made that happen. It's incredible what an Archimedes lever that was. And uh, so I've decided to uh, commit, and I haven't, this is the first time I'm saying this publicly, but to commit a, a million dollars over the next several years to this. And I would encourage anyone who recognizes and that for me that is a, a very large, the largest possible commitment that I've ever made. And it's, it's reflective of how incredibly important I think this is. And, and it's, there are so many things that are really within a few hundred meters of the finish line. It's as if, you know, Roland and others have been doing all the hard work to run this super ultra marathon for 20, 30 years, whatever it might be. And now you have the chance to receive the baton and just get the photo finish across the finish line. Whether it's with the phase three trials, Europe, training up therapists, it's, it's really right on the cusp. So if you, uh, have heard of someone, know someone has had their life changed or even saved by these as I do, I'd consider, I'd recommend that you check out USONA, uh, U-S-O-N-A, as it relates to psilocybin, MAPS, certainly, MAPS.org as it relates to MDMA. And uh, if you would like to have a conversation with me and my team, if you want to actually come to bat and uh, do something larger, right, let's just say 100,000 plus over a course of years, uh, let me know and just go to tim.blog forward slash science because this is within grasp. Like it is right on the cusp of making this legally available with proper supervision to the people who need it most. Uh, and it's really rare that you have a chance to bend the arc of history in that way. Like I don't, for me, it's like a non-recurring phenomenon. I'm like, okay, this is, this type of opportunity is not likely to come to me a second time. Uh, so that is my bully pulpit closing comments. But Roland, uh, 
thank you so much, first and foremost, for your dedication and your rigor in the standards that you have brought to bear on this subject with great difficulty and your just unbelievable perseverance uh, that is a product of belief which is born of data, right? good data. And it's just a hell of a thing. And um, so I view you very much as, as a hero for that reason. I know a lot of people within the scientific community feel the same way. And this, this has not always been popular. And you've written that really well. So I want to thank you for your work, first and foremost, and second, for making the time to come here today. So thank you. Thank you, Appreciate it. And uh, for everybody here, for uh, everybody watching, number one, thank you for taking a moment out of your very, very busy schedule to share some time with us. It's very meaningful to me. It's very meaningful to Roland. And the uh, links to everything we have mentioned will be in the show notes, tim.blog forward slash podcast. That, that'll, that'll be up as soon as this is published. And uh, yeah, if you want to have a chat about supporting the science, uh, now is the time to do that. So tim.blog forward slash science. And thank you guys for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.